Now then, my task this evening is to speak about the fruit of the Reformation. Some years ago, I remember a conversation with uh, John Lennox, and we were talking about the importance of history uh, in determining the identity uh, of Christians. And John happened to say, say to me, Lindsay, if we don't know where we've come from, we won't know who we are, and we certainly won't know where we're going. All Christians should have a historical perspective because our faith is an historic and historical uh, faith. And on that basis, Luther himself on one occasion said there's nothing so short as the Christian's memory. That's how many problems come into the church because we forget the lessons from the past. Or I think of the words of Peter in one of the epistles in the New Testament where he said simply, remember not to forget. In other words, let's not forget God's acts in history. Well, uh, what can we learn from the Reformation? How can you cover the legacy of the Reformation in 40 minutes? Well, I'm going to try and offer a, a, a succinct a summary as a Welshman can, focusing on three areas of the legacy uh, of the Reformation. I think legacy number one was that it uh, recovered the essence of the gospel. And we've heard three magisterial uh, lectures and presentations on that over the last few days. So I won't spend too much on that. But the second uh, dimension or the second legacy uh, of the Reformation was the reshaping and reforming of the world and particularly uh, Europe. Modern Europe is as it is today because of some of the impact of the fruit of the Reformation. And the third dimension I'd like to speak about is the recapturing of a vision for evangelism and mission which had been lost in the church in the previous 1,000 years. So those are the three uh, main headings for our framework. Firstly, a recovery of the essence of the gospel. Now, I think it's important to note that we had this wonderful presentation on the doctrine of justification by grace through faith last night, and then on uh, the nature of the scriptures uh, just the day before. Uh, but, many, but the reformers never thought that they were teaching a new thing. All they thought they were doing was uh, repeating uh, what had been communicated in the past in the, by the apostles and the early church fathers. Luther wrote himself, we teach no new thing, but we repeat and establish old things which the apostles and all godly teachers have taught before us. A bishop in the Anglican Church in England, John Jewell, a few years later, uh, wrote these words, we bring you nothing but what the apostles and what Christ our Savior has brought before us. Or Lancelot Andrews, uh, who was the uh, head translator of the Bible into what became the King, known as the King James Version in 1611 in England, said this, we are not innovators, but renovators. In other words, we're trying to remind people of the message which has been encrusted by the Catholic Church uh, over the centuries. And it's important to understand also that the word evangelical didn't come into being in the 16th century in the Reformation. Some historians, particularly from non-Protestant backgrounds, have tried to argue that uh, Protestants and uh, particularly evangelicals uh, are what we call in English Johnny-come-lately. In other words, uh, a, a sect that came into existence in the 16th, uh, 16th century. However, the word was used way before the uh, creation of the Roman Catholic or the Eastern Orthodox Church. It's certainly, as far as I can tell, used in the debates with the heretic Marcion in AD 180. And the significance of this is that the term evangelical, describing all those whose aspiration is to sit under the authority of Scripture, was used of authentic early New Testament Christianity before these other churches came into existence. It's an old term. And as uh, Mike said uh, last night, uh, he quoted William Tyndale, I believe, uh, who said of the word evangelion, a Greek, it's a Greek word meaning good and merry, glad tidings which makes a man's heart glad and makes him sing, dance, and leap for joy. So if we think of the recovery of the essence of the gospel, over the last few days, we've looked at key theological foundations uh, which, on which we must be unwavering, justification by grace through faith, scripture as our final authority, and the priesthood uh, of all believers.
Essentially, the reformers sought to answer two questions. By what means am I saved? Can I enter into a relationship with the God of the Bible? And what is my final authority? How do I know what is true? And the answer to these two questions were found in the doctrine of justification by grace through faith at first, and then the supremacy uh, of Scripture. And in the little book that uh, Mike Reeves has just published or written, together with another piece by John Stott, entitled The Reformation, What You Need to Know, Mike writes this, a divine declaration, uh, justification by grace through faith, that the righteousness of Christ is imputed to the believer because of God's grace to us, sola gratia, this grace, this justification is through faith alone, sola fide, in Christ alone, solus Christus, and the true record is found in Scripture alone, sola scriptura. Well, it's interesting with reference to the doctrine of justification by grace, as far as I can tell, for those who are interested in the history of revival, uh, that it is uh, the doctrine which seems to resurface in many revivals in history. The only one I can find personally as a, as a historian where, which didn't have the rediscovery of justification by grace through faith at its heart was probably the Welsh revival, my own country, in 1904-5, which some people historically would argue was a time of the birth of the modern day Pentecostal movement. So justification by grace through faith was pivotal, uh, as we've heard. And that's why Luther himself wrote these compelling, these beautiful words. I love this sentence by Luther. If you knew what you were saved from, you die of fear. But because of God's justifying grace, if you knew what you were saved for, you die of joy. Now, of course, the doctrine is a great doctrine, and we've looked at the theological dimensions of it, but we also need to try to communicate it in simple ways that the ordinary person in the street can understand. I remember my own experience uh, nearly 40 years ago when I was on a year team with Operation Mobilization uh, in Africa in the country of Sierra Leone, speaking in an open-air meeting. In Sierra Leone, they speak a cryptic form of English uh, called Creole. So instead of saying, how are you today? They say, how the body? Instead of saying, I'm very well, thank you. They say, uh, plenty, plenty, fine. I was with an Irish friend at the time in the country. It wasn't John Lennox, it was somebody else. And instead of saying, be my friend in Creole in Sierra Leone, they say, uh, be my paddy, to which my Irish friend said, well, I am a paddy already. So what's the big deal? Anyway, I was speaking in the open air meeting and I was trying to communicate something of the wonder of the doctrine of just justification by grace. I was getting very technical and theological and I had a translator alongside me. He let me speak for five minutes and when I'd given my theological explanation of justification by grace through faith, he just turned to me and he said, him, God say he okay. And everybody understood <laughs> the nature of justification by grace through faith. The second thing, of course, they discovered was Scripture as a uh, final uh, authority. What is important to understand about the Reformers is that they sought to go back to the sources of Scripture, and so should we. The source for our faith is not actually the Reformers, great though they, they are. If we want to mirror or follow or copy them, we will do what they did, which is actually go to test uh, all things by looking at the source documents in the New Testament, the Scriptures. That's why, uh, of course, Luther famously said at the imperial court in Worms in 1521, before the Holy Roman Emperor Charles V, I'm bound by the Scriptures I've quoted, and my conscience is captive to the Word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything since it's neither safe nor right to go against my conscience. I cannot do otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. It was because of Luther's commitment to Scripture and the Reformers that he was passionate about the translation of the Scriptures into the German language. And he probably translated the New Testament into his own language faster than anyone in history. Luther translated the New Testament from the Greek text into German in 11 weeks. Uh, it, he was an astonishing writer at the height of the Reformation for a four-year period. He wrote, on average, a 200-page book uh, 
or the equivalent, every two weeks. He was a staggering, erudite uh, giant, but he engaged in the translation of Scripture because of his conviction uh, that it was central to understanding the Christian faith. And so the second thing that we see from the Reformers is Scripture as our final authority. And from Luther and subsequently, Trubar is one of these people, many translations of the Scriptures occurred all across the continent so that people could understand the message of the gospel in their own language. Wycliffe in England had tried to translate, had translated the Scriptures about a hundred years before, but actually the words were in handwritten texts. Soon after Luther translated the New Testament, uh, Tyndale himself, who died in 1535, uh, translated the text into beautiful English prose and smuggled from Belgium 16,000 copies uh, into England. And it had an immense impact. Some preachers said they were standing up in churches and they could hardly preach because people were gossiping and discussing the text of Scripture uh, in the congregation. And uh, the babble uh, diminished their capacity to connect with them. The other dimension, of course, was the priesthood of all believers, whereby they argued that uh, Luther argued that laymen could read and understand the Scripture for themselves because the essential message was clear. The basic meaning could be understood by a plowman as well as by uh, a prince. Now, one of the other consequences of these doctrinal emphases was that Luther wanted to put it all to music. And um, the first, he wrote a poem uh, about his love of music. It was entitled... Frau Musica. He wrote the first Protestant songbook in Wittenberg, in German, with the help of his friend Torgel. Uh, he argued that we should preach the gospel and sing the gospel in the schools so everyone could understand. Uh, in Saxony, from 1528 onwards, in all the schools, school regulations were established so that four hours of teaching took place per week for boys and girls including the singing of songs related to Scripture. Adult music groups and singers uh, came into existence. Four-part harmonies were established uh, in every town in Saxony within 50 years uh, of the writing of the New Testament. Women sang in the churches for the first time. Men and women sang together. The rich and poor sang together. Congregational singing replaced tenors. Uh, four times a year, Luther or, uh, inaugurated the practice of having a special meal with beer uh, on four occasions in churches. So much so that Dermot McCulloch, professor of uh, church history in Oxford, has recently said of Luther's emphasis on music, it was the secret weapon of the Reformation. Luther did, uh, Zwingli didn't want any music in church services. He thought it would be a distraction. And Cal Calvin, who emphasized metric psalms, uh, was said that it was too elaborate to have choral music. It may stop you thinking about God. But by comparison, Luther said, next to the word of God, music deserves the highest praise. When people sing in four or five parts, it's like a square dance in heaven. And so Luther and the Reformation, therefore, enriched our approach to the worship and the singing of hymns, as well as the production of the Scriptures. So that's the first thing that we should remember, the um, recovery of the essence of the gospel and the implications in terms of the reading and translating of Scripture and the singing of hymns and worship. And of course, he wrote Ein Feste Burg, the song that we sang just a few moments ago. But the second uh, dimension to the legacy of the Reformation is the contribution it made to reforming the world. Or not just reforming the world, but reshaping the world. Modern day Europe has been shaped by the impact, the wider impact of the application of biblical truth to every area of society. Uh, Luther and Calvin smashed down the barrier between sacred and secular, and we may need to reflect on this in our own generation. It was one of the inheritors of Calvin's worldview and theology, 
Abraham Kuyper, uh, who founded the Free University of Amsterdam, was a reformed pastor and also became prime minister of the Netherlands, who wrote, in the total expanse of human life, there's not a single square centimeter of which Christ, who alone is sovereign, does not declare that is mine. Now, some people would argue that we've lost our way in Europe since about the mid part of the 19th century because we retreated from this commitment to apply biblical truth rigorously to every sphere of society. The church has always struggled historically with its approach to the world, and there have been one of three approaches, really, separation, assimilation, or engagement and transformation. Separation was the dominant view uh, before the Reformation, and it's exemplified, for example, in a famous book by Thomas a. Kempis, which many of us will know of, entitled The Imitation of Christ. That's the title. But let me read to you the subtitle of the book, The Imitation of Christ and the Contempt of the World and All Its Vanities. That's a classic separationist view. The gospel is all, and we have little to say in terms of engaging biblical truth to every sphere of society. So there's no sense of a Christian worldview there, or the lordship of Christ over every sphere of society. Luther struggled with the issue himself, incidentally, with his doctrine of the two kingdoms, a private Christian ethic versus the public morality based on the force of the state. Some people historically have reacted against the separationists and argued for assimilation. And of course, that's brought us liberal theology and all its destruction uh, in the church in Europe. But the third way, which I think is the biblical way, which has its roots theologically in the doctrine of the incarnation of Christ, is engaging in the world but retaining our distinctiveness. As John Stott once said, the calling of all Christians is to be morally distinct without being socially segregated. And our problem is often we confuse the two. And one of the inheritors of uh, this uh, view of engaging in the culture without imbibing or taking on the culture, of course, is the great theologian John Stott. Calvin's view was slightly more subtle than Luther's here because he emphasized engagement balanced by an insistence on the maintenance of identity. I think he once said, if the world is a wasteland, then the church is to be an oasis. We are to pass through this world as though it were a foreign country, treating lightly all earthly things uh, and declining to set our hearts on them. So then let's look briefly at some areas where Calvin and others sought to apply biblical truth to the world in which they lived in the 16th century as reforming agents. And as we look through these, you may think in some areas we have failed somewhat, we've lost our way, which will be all the more reason for, refresh, for challenging ourselves to ask how then should we live in order to reform the cultures in which we live today as inheritors of the example of the reformers. First is the area of economics. Now it was Max Weber, uh, the thinker, who argued that under Roman Catholicism, the accumulation of capital was viewed as intrinsically sinful. This was the traditional view. Money lending was not allowed based on the prohibitions given to the Jews in the Old Testament. Luther was a traditionalist in this sense. He argued that Christians should willingly and gladly lend money without charge. Uh, usury was prohibited to the Jews in the Old Testament, as it seems to have been in Luke 6, verse 35. Give and expect nothing in return. Calvin, however, 20 years later in 1545, was more subtle in his approach. He said, not all rules set out for the Jews in the Old Testament are binding on all Christians. They offer moral guidance only. So he broke new ground when he accepted the possibility of 10% interest uh, on loans. Because he was trying to make a distinction between the principle and the purpose of a prohibition rather than the prohibition himself. So he wrote, we ought not to judge usury, money lending, according to a few passages of a scripture, but in accordance with the principle of equity. 
His concern was to avoid the exploitation of the poor. But this led to a very significant shift, uh, the creation of variable interest rates, uh, a contribution to the birth of the Swiss banking system. And it's very interesting to note the difference between some of the Flemish or Belgian Catholic states and Holland in about 1650, the income per head of population, the gross national product in the Dutch uh, Protestant provinces was twice that in Belgium as a result of these changes uh, issuing from Calvin's recommendations. And the Roman Catholic Church only followed in terms of its acceptance of loans in 1830. Now, you may say uh, the capitalist system has not necessarily been a great thing, but it certainly poured a lot brought a lot of people out of poverty. If you want to read more on this, perhaps the most billion, uh, balanced treatment is by Donald Hay, professor of economics uh, in Oxford, who's written two books, A Christian Critique of Capitalism and A Christian Critique of Communism, uh, in which he says the problem of capitalism is, it, is that it underestimates the depth of human selfishness. And the problem of Marxism it's, is, is that it seeks to ignore the fact that the proletariat sin as much as the bourgeoisie. Anyway, that's the first area, work and vocation, uh, which the reformers' teaching had an impact on as they sought to carefully apply scripture to their context. Another area in terms of reforming the world was the, 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 the sphere of education. Uh, Luther's translation of the Bible and that done by others had a major impact. Following on in 1529, Luther wrote his catechism and established a question and answer format as normative in the churches. He instituted family Bible readings and prayer. For those who are interested from the UK, uh, he and Calvin influenced Richard Baxter, the reformed pastor, who when he went to the town of Kidderminster said later, uh, he regarded as his greatest success the following. When he arrived here, he said, there were no family devotions in any home. At the end of my ministry, Following the example of Lutheran Calvin, 300 families were holding family devotions at which neighbors also gathered. So education was central. The Geneva Academy came into existence in 1559. Both Calvin and Luther believed in universities, and there's an argument historically for arguing that the Reformation spread through the universities. In fact, Luther in 1523 said, if you want to change the world, start with the university. There were very few universities at the time. In the hundred years before Luther, less than 10 universities came into existence when the Catholic Church was dominant across Europe. In the hundred years after Luther, more than 50 universities came into Europe because of the, into existence in Europe because of the emphasis on education by Luther and by Calvin. He became, by 1522, Europe's most published author. And in a sermon entitled, On Keeping Children in School, he wrote this. The knowledge, knowledge of all kinds is so abundant today, what with so many books and so much reading, one can learn more in three years than in the past in 20. Christianity can only be saved if there are more schools. He wanted the German princes to bring, to support education. Education was made available uh, for literature, history, uh, and other subjects, equally for boys and girls. This was revolutionary. Because by the late 16th century, most German schools were gender balanced. If you compare that with somewhere like Venice, which was in a Catholic cultural context, the schools were only for boys. So a huge difference. And in that sense, one could argue that Luther and those who came after him laid the foundations for the education, perhaps the emancipation of women. And you should read also, for your interest, Luther's view on sexuality and marriage. In his table talks, talk, he talk, says that uh, wives should have as much pleasure out of sexual union in marriage as husbands. So in many ways, he was quite revolutionary in the way that he viewed uh, uh, women. Then a third dimension, uh, a consequence of engagement within the world was the birth, some historians argue, of liberal democracy and religious toleration. And I want to draw your attention here to a book, uh, an article 
entitled The Missionary Roots of Liberal Democracy by Robert Woodbury. It is a brilliant, scintillating article. If you want to be proud of evangelicalism and uh, what he calls conversionary Protestantism, read this article, which is published in May 2012 uh, in the American Political Science Review. He's a teacher in Singapore University. He argues, I'll give you the essence of his argument, that historically and statistically, conversionary Protestants, as he calls them, heavily influenced the rise and spread of democracy around the world. They were a crucial catalyst initiating the development and spread of religious liberty, mass education, mass printing, newspapers, voluntary organizations, and colonial reforms, thereby creating the conditions for more stable democracy more likely. And there are five or six dimensions to his argument. First, he says that democracy came into existence not, as many historians argue, through secular rationality or urbanization or industrialization, but through the impact of conversionary Protestant missionaries. And he argues that some of the people who picked this up, who were secularists, like John Locke in England, Hugo Grotius, in the Netherlands, Ben Franklin in the US, Jean-Jacques Rousseau in France, that they actually provided a secularized version of what Protestant missionaries were already advocating. He says of John Locke that he actually stole his notion of the equality of all peoples from uh, explicitly religious uh, convictions. Secondly, he argues that especially when the Protestant missionaries across the world were financially independent of the state and of slave owners and white settlers that they often undermine these elites in, way, in ways that fostered democracy and demonstrated a care for the ordinary human being uh, and reduced the abuses of power. He has lots of statistical evidence for this. Then he argues that the colonial governments and settlers and business people generally they uh, avoided mass education. They preferred to deal with an edu educated elite in a culture because they thought it would be easier to get their way. And they were unhappy with missionaries who argued for mass education. Stable democracies, he argued, first emerged in Protestant countries, especially after World War II. And they were discouraged or lagged behind, often in Roman Catholic and Orthodox parts of South and Eastern Europe, until and Latin America until about 1970. And the Roman Catholic Church has only begun to promote uh, democratization since then. He argues that after the fall of communism in Eastern Europe, therefore subsequently, that it was in, in the Roman Catholic and Protestant cultures where this had been emphasized, that st more stable transitions occurred, like in Lith Lithuania, Latvia, uh, Estonia, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and so on. And then finally, he argues that historians of the 19th century argued that the Methodists, the Baptists, and the Quakers, they called them extremists. And I'm going to quote him directly on this. Because these three groups of people dominated the campaign against uh, abolition. And he writes, in 19th century academic circles, dominant academic ideologies viewed black people as biologically inferior and that educating them beyond manual labor was useless. These missionaries fought against this. In retrospect, most of us think that the fanatics were right and the ideologists were wrong. The other dimension is the birth of religious toleration. Following Luther and Calvin, you have the Peasants' War, you have the 30 years of religious wars with perhaps four million people killed, which is something we can't be proud of. But subsequent to that, you have the arrival of a rather unusual man called Oliver Cromwell. Uh, I studied his, I've read all his speeches and all his letters uh, in university, and I confess he is something of a hero. Uh, often uh, maligned and misunderstood because he was the first Protestant leader anywhere to support religious toleration as a matter of principle. 
He initiated the invitation of Jews back into England after they'd been cut out for three, four hundred years. And he even said he would have accepted Muslims if they would come. This was because he believed that different worldviews should be allowed to be propagated in public and the superior, superiority of the truth claims of the gospel would be demonstrated over these alternative worldviews. So we should tolerate the propagation of other views, provided the Christian worldview can be set against it, and even put government money towards supporting uh, evangelical preachers in many towns where they didn't exist uh, in the UK. So he was the father in some ways of religious toleration, though it was a different notion in the 17th century, because today toleration is often confused with pluralism and relativism. Toleration in the 16th, 17th century under Cromwell was viewed as, uh, you believe that, I believe this, I think your view is wrong, but I tolerate it. Today we have a different notion, you believe that, I believe this, doesn't matter, it's all the same in the end. It's a different notion of toleration. What about the world of the arts? Uh, Protestants have had an uneasy relationship between Protestantism and visual art. One Welsh poet, R.S. Thomas, rather cynically, once wrote that Protestantism is the castrator of the arts. But actually, he's misunderstood. It is true that uh, in the early Reformation, icons were destroyed, walls were whitewashed, statues smashed. But it was a reaction to the theology linked with that. Calvin argued that images of God should be excluded, but he didn't extend this exclusion to other subject matter. Paintings and sculpture for Calvin was perfectly permissible as a gift of God. Luther was also uh, positive. He forbade the worship of art, art and artifacts, not the making of art. And listen to their successors in the Dutch Confession of Faith who wrote this. The world is before our eyes as a beautiful book in which uh, all created things, great and small, are like letters, which give us the invisible things of God to behold. And look at two quotations here from Luther and Calvin themselves. I am not of the opinion that through the gospel, Luther said, all the art should be banished and driven away as some zealots want, us to make, want to make us believe. But I wish to see them all, especially music, in the service of him who gave, gave and created them. Calvin then wrote, the invention of the arts is a gift of God by no means to be despised. So in what sense did the Reformation bring about a change in how the visual arts should be viewed? Let me suggest quickly three. First is that from the time of the reformers, and especially when the Dutch painters came in and theologians, they began to argue that all of life was worth painting. Previously, uh, most art in uh, Europe was by Catholic painters, but from the time of the Reformation onwards, you have, especially with the advent of the Dutch, painting of landscapes or flowers or wine or shells because they viewed all these things are, as gifts from God's good hand. All of life was worth pointing, painting. Then secondly, the Renaissance world before the Reformation prov provided an idealized view of the world, whereas post-Reformation painters saw the world as it is and they worked from a Christian vision of life understood within a framework of belief and creation, fall and redemption. This gritty realism uh, ran counter to the Neoplatonic preference for idealized forms. There's a quotation coming up on the screen from John Walford, who's written a, a beautiful book called uh, About Art, uh, looking at this, called The Beauty of God, Theology and the Arts. And he says that the Protestant painters, both in the Netherlands and elsewhere in Germany, uh, that they had this notion of a broken beauty. I think someone quoted Schaeffer's uh, words, a glorious ruin, a few days ago. And you can see it exemplified in this next picture which comes up here, which is by Rembrandt. Many people think it's his mother, but it's, uh, it's known as Rembrandt's mother, but the painting is entitled The Prophetess Anna. What you see here, which is different about uh, Protestant painters, particularly Rembrandt, is if you get a close-up of her, uh, 
you can see the wrinkles on her skin, on her hands. You can see how the aging process is etched out on her face. So there's the fallenness and the brokenness and the world weariness of age. But the light of the scripture comes into the painting and you have this redemptive image of the word of God which brings life and joy and hope. The other thing is that Samuel Escobar, the Latin American missiologist, has argued that very few Catholic painters painted the resurrection, which the next painting shows us. I just saw this a few weeks ago in Aschaffenburg in the local gallery. It's by Lucas Cranach, uh, the person who painted uh, Luther, Protestant painter, and one of the first paintings of the resurrection of Christ after the, um, after, uh, the impact of Luther. Well, I don't have much more time except to say the other area perhaps would be the field of the sciences. Um, I'm not a scientist, and I hear there's been a brilliant presentation on uh, the impact of the Reformation on the science sciences a presentation earlier this week you might want to get hold of. But there is a superb book that we give out to students all around Europe in type by a, a Dutch writer called Richard Hoikas called Religion and the Rise of Modern Science, in which he argues that many of the inaugurators of the modern scientific approach have their roots in a biblical and a Christian worldview. And he quotes, of course, uh, Johannes Kepler, the astronomer, as saying in his research that he was merely thinking God's thoughts after him. And there were many others like that in the early years following the Reformation. Well, that's the second lengthy presentation. I realize I've taken a long time, but I've done so because uh, often we don't realize that uh, the teachings of the reformers spurred people to seek to apply the biblical worldview to every sphere of life. And we impoverish the church if we do not do likewise. Our primary calling is to proclaim and live out the gospel of Christ. But if God is our loving heavenly father who gives us, quote, all things richly and freely to be enjoyed, should we not therefore seek to communicate to our congregations and to the people of God, the sovereignty of God over the whole of creation? And uh, earlier on, I think I missed out the dimension of uh, work and the workplace. Uh, forgive me for doing that. But one of the distinctives of Calvin and Luther was that they had this strong emphasis on vocation and calling, which is you'd out of the priesthood of all believers uh, in their writings. And um, let me quote to you what Tyndale said uh, as they sought to apply the doctrine of the priesthood of all believers to the workplace. Tyndale said, while washing of dishes and preaching of the word of God represent different activities, he insisted, quote, as touching to please God, there is no essential difference. So their views had a remarkable impact on the world of work. No longer are we called to leave the world to serve God, but we are called to serve God in the world. And one of the most striking statements about this in uh, the last century is by Martin Luther King, influenced by this theology of the workplace, uh, in which he said this when he went on a visit to Jamaica. As he arrived in the airport, speaking to crowds, he said, in the light of what the reformers had taught, no work is insignificant. If it falls to you to be a street cleaner, sweep the streets like Michelangelo painted a picture. Sweep the streets like Beethoven composed music. Sweep the streets like Shakespeare wrote a poetry. Do it so that all the host of heaven and those around are caused to pause and say of this man or woman, they lived the lives of a great street cleaner. All of that comes from a new theology of the workplace and the breaking of uh, the emphasis on the clergy and the laity, but that all men and women under God's sovereignty are called to serve him wherever he has placed them. Well, my time is virtually gone. But I do want to finish off briefly by commenting on Calvin particularly and Luther's recapturing a vision for evangelism and mission. Uh, historians, and I think a lot of revision has to occur here because 
For about 450 years, most historians have argued that the reformers were not interested in mission. Let me quote for you. Ralph Winter, the great missiologist in America, said there are three great periods of mission, Carey, Hudson Taylor, and post-Second World War, Donald McGavran and Cam Townsend. Quote, Calvin did not give very much attention to mission. He didn't seem to talk of missionary research. Stephen Neal, the great Anglican missiologist, in his book, The History of Mission, doesn't mention Calvin at all. Gustav Warbeck says, Calvin claimed that the church had no responsibility to engage in mission. A.N. Hunter, there is no trace of missionary initiative in the writings of Calvin. But I think Johannes Verkeil, the Dutch missiologist, uh, has a much more subtle understanding because he said, you need to understand that these were men of their times. There, were, there was little organization after the break from Rome, no structure, so you're trying to build a church from nowhere. They were too busy in the early years working on internal reform. And in addition, much of the world hadn't been discovered. Then the, the Atlantic Ocean was policed by uh, the Spanish and Portuguese ships representing Catholic kingdoms. So they wouldn't let Protestant uh, organized ships through. But if you look at Luther, first of all, you only have to look at the impact on the Baltics. The UK, many people say that uh, Elizabeth I's religious settlement was more Lutheran than Anglican. The Nordic countries, the Wittenberg windows, and if you go to Wittenberg, have a look at these, it will shock you. 12 reformers, see if you can recognize, any of them I can recognize, Knox. But do the Swedes know of the Swedish reformer listed there, or Pietro Martirelli from uh, Italy. Thomas Cranmer is there, Gaspar de Colini from France, but there are others from Slovakia, Bohemia, Romania, Hungary, Jan Lasky, very significant influence in Poland, in addition to Trubar, who we mentioned earlier. All these people were influenced by Luther in the propagation of the gospel. What this demonstrates is this. You cannot and we should not separate a conviction the gospel is true from taking it to the ends of the earth. If we do not take it, deep down, we are not really believing it's true. Now, what happened with Luther and his followers is gripped by the new doctrines. They took this message to the ends of Europe, which is basically the world as they knew it at the time. But if you move over to Calvin, Calvin had a remarkable theology. Just before I close, two things about him. First of all, his theology was influenced by three things. A concern for the, a conviction about the victorious advance of Christ and his kingdom and his glory, the doctrine of the open doors and the great commission. Let me just quote to you from some of his uh, from some of his commentaries, what Calvin said about world evangelization. I'm not sure how much these missiologists have read Calvin's works in French. Maybe that, that's why they haven't seen it. I'll just give you a few quotes in the introduction to the Institutes. He says, God the Father has appointed Christ to rule from sea to sea and to the ends of the earth. His commentary on 1 Timothy 2, he says, Jesus came to extend his grace not just to the few, but over, the, over all the world. His commentary on Acts 2, speaking about the Holy Spirit coming, he says, the gospel should reach all the ends and extremities of the world. In Deuteronomy 32, in his commentary, he says, when we know God as our Father, should we not have a passion that all creatures know his glory? Deuteronomy 33, we must as much as in us lies Endeavor to draw all men on earth to him. 1 Timothy 2. No people, no rank in the world is excluded from salvation because God wishes that the gospel should be proclaimed to all without exception. Now, does that smack of somebody who's not interested in evangelism and mission? I have 10 other quotes here I could give you from the writings of Calvin which show his passionate commitment to taking the gospel to the ends of the earth and to evangelism. And as I close, he had a tenfold approach to evangelization. Preaching, you'd expect, countless prayers, the word of God, 
godly living literature. He started 34 printing presses in 15 years in Geneva from 1540 to 55 or 60. They poured out when there was a population of about 20,000 people, 300,000 books a year, which were taken by coal porters into France and elsewhere. Then he uh, instituted the training program in the Geneva Academy, concentrating on the children of the aristocracy. Then notice his creativity in engaging with rulers and magistrates. Knox wrote an article against uh, queens, attacking Mary, Queen of Scots and Queen Elizabeth of England, and the article was entitled Against the Mos Monstrous Regiment and Hordes of Women. Calvin banned it in Geneva because he said this would disrupt communication with other kings and queens, or queens especially, across Europe, and could be detrimental to the advance of the gospel. And incidentally, he did the same thing to Farrell when in 1644, 34, he wrote, anti, produced anti-Catholic posters in Paris entitled The True Articles on the Horrible, Great, and Insufferable Abuses of the Papal Mass. Calvin rebuked Farrell because Francis I at the time was somewhat sympathetic, and afterwards he turned against the Protestants. So you see how clever Calvin was in recognizing you don't just try to bypass the kings and the queens, but that you try to engage with them as best as possible for the advance of the gospel. Then he, in, he was involved in public dialogue. John Lennox has told us about his uh, dialogues. Listen to this one. When Calvin first went to Geneva, Farel and Vire went to Lausanne for a debate. They challenged all the Catholic priests in the canton, 330 of them to a dialogue. 174 turned up. The debate was about the nature of transubstantiation. A great Catholic figure got up to speak, and he argued that the early church fathers were in favor of transubstantiation. Vire and Farrell didn't know how to answer, and they turned to the young Calvin, who was in his 20s, and said, do you know how to respond to this accusation against the early fathers? At which point, Calvin quoted paragraphs by memory from the early church fathers attacking the doctrine of transubstantiation. He won the debate. A hundred Catholic priests left the Catholic Church after that debate. One was converted and Lausanne became a Protestant area. One debate, one dialogue. Then he was committed to work amongst migrants, of course, and it has implications for us, people coming from all across Europe to live uh, in Geneva. And many of them then took the gospel to the Netherlands, to Hungary, to Scotland. I don't have time to go into all of them. Someone went to India as the first missionary 200 years before Kerry. Others were sent to Brazil. Uh, it was remarkable. And even the secular historian, Jeffrey Elton in Cambridge said this of John Knox, not John Knox, refreshed by springs from the fountain head, he took the gospel to Scotland, where he said to God, give me Scotland or I die. In addition, they sent out many missionaries. You look, I've looked at the documents uh, from Geneva, from um, uh, Genevan preachers who went out between 1555 to 1562 on the register of the Company of Pastors and Missionaries. In 1555, there were just a few. By 1561, it was over 100, maybe as many as 140. Uh, 100 went out in 1662. So imagine that number of missionaries going out. He focused on a handful of dressed churches. There were only perhaps 59 of them, uh, 32 of them, in uh, 59 in 32 in 1959, but by, 19, by that 15, 1562, it was 100 dressed churches. He had a very strong focus on church planting. I can see that my time is gone, so I'm going to give you two last quotes from Calvin uh, in this respect <laughs> to encourage you. This is what he said. Listen to these words. I am inflamed with desire for the advance of the gospel. Now that's from a heart of mission. Let me give you another one. When he spoke to Bullinger, he wrote, he said these words, it is unbelievable 
to see how impetuously our brothers are rushing forward to take the gospel into France. Our resources are exhausted. They are knocking my door in the middle of the night. Some congregations go to church on Sunday and the pastors have left to take the gospel to France. By 1560, there were perhaps as many as two million evangelicals in France. It seems to me the only reason it burnt out was because Calvin died without a successor in 1564 and because of the St. Bartholomew's Day massacre eight years later when hundreds of thousands of Protestants were killed. But it would be folly to say that there was no vision for mission and evangelism. So one uh, historian has said, what happened from Geneva between 1555 and 1565 was perhaps the greatest outpouring of missionary endeavor since the first century. I think those historians better rewrite the history books. Three things, brothers and sisters, are our legacy that we should take away from our gathering this week. One is concentrate on our doctrinal and theological foundations in defense of the gospel. Secondly, maybe we need to repent of retreating from the world and in a fresh do the hard work of thinking, how can I apply biblical truth in all its full-orbed substance to every sphere of society so that people might acknowledge the lordship and the glory of Christ over the whole of creation? And thirdly, let's not give up on the re-evangelization and the taking of the gospel to the ends of Europe and to the ends of the earth in honor of Christ our King and following the example of Truba, Calvin, Luther, Zwingli, and those other reformers. It's our turn. Let's go for it.